Let's start okay. getting going in just a second here. Right, we're right. up on YouTube as well. All right, got participants uh, about 20, 30 more seconds. It's coming in. Sounds good. Yeah, talking fossils. All right, All right let's do this. Hi hey everyone, my name is Lauren Wagner. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the Learning Operations Coordinator here at the Field Museum. And I'm gonna be helping with Jeff Schroeder today, answer some of your questions and talk through fossils today. Jeff? Great, thanks Lauren. Jeff Schroeder, he, him. And I am going to talk fossils with our audience today. So hopefully if you're watching, you got a chance to see our original Discovery Adventures um, what is a fossil? And we talked a lot about fossils. We were live in the museum for that one. We visited the fossil prep lab. We went into the dinosaur area and some other parts. And we did a little activity called Fossil and Fossil Not, which we are going to repeat today with some different fossils to test your knowledge. But yeah, it was all about fossils and discussing how they're found, what they are, what paleontologists do with them, and what they learn from them and study. And fossils are really, really cool things. So. We are going to start out and Lauren, just see if we had any uh, questions which had rolled in ahead of time from any of our schools or viewers about fossils. Absolutely, Jeff. And for our audience who's just joined us here, please put your questions in the chat feature and we'll be sure to cover them. So the first question here is, can teeth become fossils? All right. Can teeth become fossils? Absolutely, teeth can become fossils. In fact, you could have something like a T-Rex tooth become a fossil. Sue, our famous T-Rex, actually has 55 teeth that have become fossils. So things that are generally like harder, like teeth or bones, tend to become fossils more easily than softer things. And so oftentimes the fossils found are teeth, like fossilized shark teeth, fossilized dinosaur teeth, um, even fossilized teeth of older animals before dinosaurs, like amphibians occasionally, and certainly can become fossils. Yes, good question. All right, any other fossil questions? You have some more here, Jeff. So you just briefly touched on sharks. One of our audience members wants to know, can sharks themselves become fossilized or just their teeth? Yeah, sharks can become fossilized. So. Um, it's harder, I think, for like cartilage to become fossilized because it's not as hard as bone, but you can still get um, shark fossils. So we have at the Field Museum a couple of fossils, which we didn't hit, I don't think, on our previous Discovery Adventure. But as you walk through, you can actually stop and look at a couple of ancient shark fossils, like old, old, old sharks, older than dinosaurs. And one of them is like super cool. And Lauren, you might remember the name. It is not coming to me. It's Heliocopteron or something like that. But it is this shark. Oh, do you know it? Helicoprion. Helicoprion. Yeah, I just pronounced it wrong. So it's got this lower jaw. I should let you talk about it, which extends down and is like wrapped around with like teeth sticking out of it. It is weird. And it's still kind of debated. Does it use it to thrash around and kill fish or stir things up? But yeah, definitely come check those shark fossils out at the Field Museum. All right, let's do one more question and then we'll talk a little bit more about fossils. Absolutely, so this question is, why does a fossil have to become a rock in order to turn into a fossil? Great lead in, great timing, Lauren, because we're gonna talk about that next. So why does a fossil have to become a rock? Well. Basically, fossilization is another word for mineralization. So by nature, by definition, a fossil has been preserved for a time and is kind of converted from its original substance. And it could contain different types of minerals or different um, substances. They're not all the same. But the uh, fossil basically has to have been something that was alive and then has been converted into rock. And what happens is it turns into that mineral or rock, you know, it turns into that substance over time. 
and usually over a long, long time, like millions of years. Now, what you get as a result is this thing that is preserved really, really well. And I'll hold this up. Okay, try to hold that really steady. Can you tell what that is, Lauren? Or if any of our audience members can tell what this is and you wanna chat it or tell us, let us know. What does that look like? I see a lot of different textures going on, Jeff. Part of it looks smooth and then part of it looks very, very rough. Yeah. So this is a fossil of a plant. It's an ancient plant. You can see its stem here and then you can see leaves coming down. And it is fossilized in this block that basically someone cut out of the rock and then was able to preserve it. So yeah, plants can fossilize. They can leave imprints and in the right conditions, um, parts of the plants like the leaves can actually fossilize. So by that preservation, these fossils and some of them 300 million years old can last a long, long time. And we can have that record of what happened long before humans were ever on the earth. That's one of the really, really cool things about fossils. All right, so now that we know what makes a fossil, for those of you who watched before, you already knew, for those who are watching for the first time, it used to be alive, or at least it's a sign of something that was alive, like a trace, like a footprint, for instance, or, uh, or and also, sorry, and also it has turned into a mineral. It has mineralized, become like a rock over time. So we're gonna do a little fossil, fossil knot, and, if you're out there watching with a class or with friends or family or relatives or whoever, go ahead and try this with them. So if we're gonna show you an object and talk a little bit about it, and if you think it's a fossil, you can either chat to us a Y for yes or an N for no, or if you're watching and you're not able to chat, if you're like watching on YouTube, if it's a fossil, I want you to tell someone around you fossil or if you don't think so, say fossil knot. So we're gonna try this and I'm also gonna try it with Lauren and we'll see what she thinks of these different things. So we're gonna do our first one and hold this up. We'll wait for about 20 seconds for our audience or 15 seconds, then Lauren can. Jeff, we got some yeses coming in from the audience and I agree with them. I think that is a fossil. And you and the audience are correct. This is a fossil. It looks like a fossil of a fern, like a fern leaf. So yes, this is a fossil. It's an imprint from a fern. It is indeed. Now, I have another one to show you. Our audience says no, Jeff. But they do not believe this is a fossil. You agree with the audience, Lauren? I do, Jeff, because I don't think it's a rock. It looks like a shell. Yeah, so it is a shell. So it has not turned into a rock. Now, a shell is part of a living thing. Living things create shells, but it is not a rock yet. It's not mineralized. So, right, it is a shell. Probably wouldn't find rare nautilus on the beach, but you could find shells on the beach, right? Now, wait a second. I have something that looks strangely like the nautilus from millions of years ago. What about this one? We're gonna move the Nautilus. Our audience now says yes, Jeff, and I do agree with them. The audience is saying yes. We've got some sharp ones out in the audience. Absolutely. This is a fossil. You can actually kind of see inside. It's not hollow like the Nautilus. It's filled in with rock, right? And it is an ammonite. I see Susan has said ammonite. Yes, it is an ammonite. And you can see it looks very much like the Nautilus related, but an ancient ammonite. Very similar, but what we have again, even though they look almost the same, is not a fossil and fossil because this one is turned into rock. They were both alive. All right, how about this? Susan in our audience says no. All right, and they are correct. This is what we call a model, right? It's not real sized. It is pretty accurate to what we think the animal looked like and it represents something that was alive and lived millions of years ago. So you can have fossils, you can have casts, which are exact replicas of fossils. Very hard to tell from the real thing. 
And then like our pterosaurs at the museum or this triceratops, you can have either life-size models or little mini models, but certainly not a fossil, even though it represents a dinosaur. All right, we're gonna get a little tougher here. I'm gonna guess, they said, oh, they said yes, too. Now, Jeff, I'm not sure, this might be a tricky one. I'm gonna go with no, because I think it's a copy. But if yeah. it was the real one, I would say yes. Yeah, so it is a copy. So this is, see how shiny it is. It looks a little too shiny. It's very probably tough to tell from home. So that's okay, I'll give you a pass on that. But it is made of plastic. So this is the exact same size, exact same shape, exact same texture down to every little crack made in it. It's an extremely well-made replica or cast of a fossil. And we use those at the Field Museum. This is a replica of one of Sue's teeth. They wouldn't let me take a real Sue tooth home. So I have to use the replica, but it is basically something that has been created from a mold of the real fossil. And we want it to be, I mean, this is successful then if you're not able to tell, we want it to be as close to the real deal as possible because that's how you would fill in the missing parts when displaying a fossil. So like Sue, we do have this tooth because this had to be made from it, right? But we have other parts of Sue, our T-Rex, where like we have the real deal for Sue's right arm. Sue's left arm was never found. So how would we have made an arm to put on Sue's left side? Hmm. I don't know if the audience has any ideas or thoughts on that. We've got Sue's real right arm, left arm was never found, but if you walk up to Sue, Sue's got two arms. Hmm. Casts can be pretty important. If our audience has any thoughts. Our audience does, maybe from another T-Rex perhaps? Yeah, so you could fill in parts from another T-Rex where you did find that part, like the tip of the tail, or you could even create it from uh, basically computer imaging of the real arm and then make the other one off of it. So there's a couple ways to do it, but yes, you can fill in those missing parts. And so you can demonstrate what this animal would have looked like during life without having all the fossils to it. All right, Lauren, next I want to put up a slide. There will be two things on the slide and they're both the same type of thing. They're either both a fossil or both not a fossil. Is this what you're looking for, Jeff? That's what I'm looking for. Perfect. It says alligator and gharial. Look carefully at those things. Are they a fossil? Or are they not a fossil? Hmm. Lauren, what do you think? I don't think so, Jeff. I'm going to guess no. They don't look like they're covered in rocks. Yeah, it's true. They look like they're bones, like they're still bone and not rock yet. So no, these are not fossils. These, this alligator and gharial, these are their skeletons, but they have not had a chance to be preserved and turn into bone yet. It's like the shell, right? So they have not become fossils. So we've learned some pretty cool things, right? About what is a fossil and what's not a fossil. And I have one final thing to show and decide if this is a fossil or not. If we go back to my main screen here from our slide. Thanks, Lauren. This kind of lumpy round thing, could it be a fossil? I'll turn it around so you can see the other side. If our audience has any thoughts. Fossil or not. And if you're watching, tell someone around you and you can tell them what you think this might be a fossil of. If you saw this lying on the ground looking like that, what could that be? So Lauren, what do you think? It definitely looks like it's some kind of mud or dirt perhaps. Oh, we do have, wait, our audience says 
They're wondering if it's poop, Jeff. It is poop. Excellent audience, yes. Someone figured it out, very good. It is poop. This is fossilized poop. And you'd see the nugget lie in there. And if you turn it over, you can kind of see inside. And I know the lighting's not great, but you can kind of see the different substances that make it up. So even poop can fossilize. And this would be more an example of a trace fossil. It's not part of the animal's body, but it comes from the animal and it tells us about what it ate or what it pooped. And Lauren, do you have a trace fossil there with you? Or at least kind of what would be similar to a trace fossil? I do have something similar to it. Unfortunately, when I was a kid, my um, childhood dog passed away and they made me a little paw print of her foot. So her name was Mindy. You can see her, her little toes and her paw pads. So this was made in um, concrete. So this is a trace fossil that shows her footprint. Nice. And so it tells you about the dog, right? And it tells you about what the animal kind of looked like. That's mm -hmm. And that's something we could um, throw out to our audience too, Lauren, is maybe a, a challenge or a fun activity that you can try is making your own fossils or your own casts. Now, they might not be true fossils if they're not ancient things preserved, but they're pretty close. And it would be a good example of a trace fossil if you could use a leaf or a paw print or some other thing that was alive to make a little fossil. So it's something fun to try. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead and see if the audience had any more questions or we have any more questions coming in, Lauren. Our audience submitted, is it possible for human skeletons to become fossilized? Oh, certainly, yes. Yes, human skeletons could become fossilized. It would just take a long time. So it's not like if there's a human that's buried like say who came over on the Mayflower or something from 1600s that their skeleton is fossilized yet. It's still buried. It's probably, if it's in the right conditions, maybe being preserved a little bit, but the skeleton would have to be preserved for a long, long time, probably thousands of years to become a fossil. And depending on conditions, kind of depends how quickly it becomes a fossil. But certainly you can have preservation, but then fossilization is preservation through minerals. So human skeletons, old, old ones, yes, can become fossils. And you can even find fossils of human, uh, early human relatives or ancestors in the hominid group. Like Lucy is a famous one of one of the first uh, hominids or basically apes within our, our kind of big family group. Yeah, other questions? Jeff, how do we know how old a fossil is when we find one? Great question, yes, because we're talking about these ages, right? So we have like basically two ways to do it. And one of the ways you may have heard of, but it's less effective. <laughs> the other way you may not have heard of, but it's more effective. So a lot of people out there and like in popular culture have heard of like carbon dating. Oh, we're gonna do carbon dating on this and see how old it is. That can take you back about 30 to maybe 40,000 years. But if you wanna talk millions or billions of years, um, the carbon doesn't work that well. You have to work with radioactive isotopes and do um, and basically radiometric dating is what it's called. And radioactive isotopes or elements, they decay or degrade at a pretty constant rate. And by looking at where they're at in a substance in the rock around the fossil, you can usually tell pretty accurately how old something is. That's how we can say that Sue is 67 million years old, or how we can look at fossilized trilobites, these ancient creatures, and say they're like 510 million years old. That's a huge long time. But by analyzing that, we can tell. Yeah, any other questions or comments from the audience, Lauren? So do we know if there's, di or do you think that there's dinosaurs out there that we haven't found yet because we have not come across their fossils? I definitely do. There are new dinosaurs being found and identified every year, I mean, really. So there are certainly going to be some more dinosaurs out there that have not been found yet, but they may be found and discovered and named. And there may be some species that lived millions and millions of years ago that maybe weren't preserved. The rocks may never come to the surface. There may be things we never even know about that lived uh, millions of years ago. But 
we're really lucky to have some of these fossils that we can at least tell many, many of these creatures like Sue or other T-Rexes and learn about them. Do you have a favorite fossil at the Field Museum, Jeff? Oh gosh, do I have a favorite fossil? Yes, so besides Sue, because you know I, I love Sue, we do Sue presentations, but besides Sue, one of the fossils I really like, we have a cast on display, I believe, but it is um, Tiktaalik. And that is this cool little critter that, um, I don't know if we might have a picture of Tiktaalik in our slideshow, like it's down near the back. Um, Tiktaalik is this weird little critter that looks like half amphibian, half fish. And it is one of the first tetrapods or animals to basically use its limbs. There were fins, kind of like legs to walk on land. And so it's what the popular culture would have in the past called a missing link, which is not a term scientists really like to use, but it is um, something that would show a part of evolution that was really, really important, a transitionary phase from water to land. And here it is, Tiktaalik, a tetrapod for the ages. You can look at that little guy, besides being kind of cute, it is really a cool animal as far as showing us, and you can see the fossil on the side there, showing us how animals first kind of adapted to come out on land, which led to so many other species like dinosaurs, like birds, which are dinosaurs, reptiles, amphibians, us. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions, Lauren? Make sure we get them. So did you know if we have any, who found some of the fossils that are on display at the Field Museum, Jeff? If we have any what, Lauren? The Do you know who found some of the fossils that are on display at the Field Museum? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have um, Field Museum paleontologists have found a lot of them. Um, I think like, let's see, I'm trying to think of like Elmer Riggs, I think was a famous one. And, you know, of course, some of the more recent ones have been found by our uh, paleontologists right now who go out and research things like um, Akiko Shinya, uh, Bill Simpson, Pete McAvicki, some of our scientists who've worked recently. Um, I think, let's see. Yeah, um, were, they, were there any questions about specific ones? We did have a question here. They wanted to know, do we know if Mary Anning found any of the fossils that we have on display or at the Field Museum? Well, Mary Anning. So this is the famous fossil hunter who found some of the early marine reptiles back in England. Um, I don't think we have any of Mary Anning's fossils. We do have a, like a mosasaur, but I don't think it's one of hers. I think a lot of those might be at London, of course, because it was it was in England. But I don't know that 100%. That would be a cool thing. And I will try to look that up. And if you... Um, if you email us, whoever sent that, we can try to get a, a concrete, so to speak, answer for you there. But yeah, Mary Anning uh, was really an uh, early fossil hunter, a woman who was uh, one of the big names in the field early on finding some of these things. Yeah, great question. <laughs> All right, so we've got a little bit of time left. Um, I wanna show one more thing here and talk about that a little bit, and then we'll see if we have any other um, kind of final questions coming in. So I just wanna talk about this, and this is another thing that I want to send out as a little bit of a, maybe a challenge or a follow-up to people if you'd like. And you look at this little kind of rock nodule, it's sort of round, isn't it? Now, does anyone think there's something inside there? I see a crack in the side of it. If I were to open it up, would we see anything in there? It's not a clamshell, although it looks like one right now. Let me open it. I'm gonna try, this one's hard to see, so I'm gonna try to hold it really still. Can you see any kind of a vague imprint inside there? A little bit, Jeff. It kind of looks like something was in there, maybe like a seed or a nut, but I'm not sure. Yep, that trace right there. So it's a fossil of probably an early jellyfish which is really weird because even soft things with no bones like jellyfish can fossilize in the right conditions, right? We keep talking about conditions or um, the way or where they're fossilized. And in Illinois, if anyone's watching from Illinois, we have a place that is about an hour and a half south of Chicago where you can find these nodules and you can actually pop them open to find different organisms inside. And that area and the way things fossilized 
tended to fossilize soft bodied things very, very well. And so you get jellyfish, you get sea anemones, you get the Tully monster, Illinois state fossil, and you can find some really unique fossils there. And you can apply for a, a permit just for a day. It's very easy to do to go hunt fossils. And so it's the Braidwood, Mazonia Fish and Wildlife Area, I believe. But if anyone wants to go on a fossil hunting trip around here, look that up, get that permission, and go hunt some fossils. And now is a pretty good time before things get super overgrown. Look for these nodules, take them home. And what you do is you put them in a bucket of water and then you freeze it and thaw it and freeze it and thaw it over and over again. And eventually they should pop open because the water goes in. If you know what happens to water when it freezes, it expands and it pops them apart because there's little gaps where the fossils are. So that's my challenge to you. And if you're watching from another state or another area, check, look online for places where you can go to fossil hunt around you and make sure that you get permission, make sure it's okay to take the fossils home and then go out and do some fossil hunting of your own. Try to find some of these really cool things. All right, Lauren, if we have one or two more questions, we just have time for those before we wrap up. Jeff, I'm curious, did you find that fossil of the jellyfish? Yes, that was one that I found. <laughs> So cool. Let's see here. We do have some more good questions in here. Oh, okay. Besides Mason Creek, is there any other good spots you'd recommend for fossil hunters in Illinois? Yeah. Um, Mason Creek is one of the best known areas and the best places to find it. If you know someone around there, like an hour south of Chicago, and they have some land, you can always um, ask and see if you can get permission because sometimes the private land is even better, but you'd have to really make sure you get permission. Um, there are also like Esconi, E-S-C-O-N-I is a fossil club and they go on field trips sometimes once we get through COVID. They go to quarries as well and rock quarries are a great place to find, but don't go in there on your own. It can be dangerous, obviously. Go in with a group or a field trip who has permission and that's in Illinois. But even along Lake Michigan sometimes. If you're walking along the lake and you look for um, little things, I might have them here, if I can find it, Lauren. This one, not gonna find them as much around Chicago, but these are called Petoskey stones and they're worn smooth by uh, the wave action, but inside you can see those little bits of like coral or ancient organisms. So you can even find fossils if you walk along Lake Michigan and look really carefully at the little rocks that are tumbled up there and just look for those little patterns that don't look like, you know, just a line, but look like more might have been alive, like a coral. So check along the lake too. It's a great way to do a walk. Another question here, Jeff, is Sue and Maximo are two of our most famous dinosaurs at the Field Museum. Why are they different colors? Oh yeah. So now just to note that Sue is mostly real and Maximo is a cast or copy, um, but Maximo is made to look authentic. So that would be pretty much Maximo's real color, right? For anyone who hasn't seen him, Maximo is almost a reddish brown and it has a lot of red in it. And Sue is more of, well, this color, kind of that dark, right? Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the different minerals that creep in or where they're fossilized. So if you have a heavy iron content, you know, it can affect, it can either make it kind of this dark, dark color, or it can even kind of give it that rusty sort of reddish color. So it depends on what's around the animal when it dies and what it's buried in, what that rock contains. So once again, these different fossilization, like not really methods, but the way it happens create sometimes different colors in the fossils. There's a T-Rex named Black Beauty I think it's out in Montana, I want to say. I hope I'm not wrong on that, but out west, and it is like a dark black. It's, it is beautiful. You know, it's a really, really neat fossil. So Lauren, quick question for you. What's your favorite fossil at the Field Museum? All right, so I actually added a quick picture of it to our slideshow, and I found it on our Field Museum website. And my favorite fossil, let me do a quick screen share here. So this is my favorite fossil at the Field Museum. It is in our Hall of Gems. It is an opalized plesiosaur vertebrae. So if you touch your back, the backbones that you'll feel there, that's your vertebrae back there. And what a plesiosaur kind of looks like a Loch Ness monster. It's a swimming marine reptile, not a dinosaur, but a prehistoric swimming reptile. Oh, Jeff here's got an example of one right there. Exactly. 
And with the opal, it's made of actually a silicon gel and it eventually hardens over time. So as the bones and pieces of the bones start to crack and break apart and decay, the gel of the opal will start to take place of where that bone was. And eventually the bone was gone and it became this beautiful fo uh, fossilized opal of the vertebrae. And I'm a little bit of a sucker. My, birth my birthday is in October and opal happens to be the birthstone of October. But I just think this is a very fascinating story. And there's a beautiful Charles Knight painting of a plesiosaur too in our museum. So I recommend checking out the Hall of Gems if you're back at the Field Museum and getting a good look at this opalized plesius for a vertebrae because it's a, it's a pretty good size fossil too. That's really neat, Lauren. That's really fun. Yeah, the fossil can be an opal as well or that it can be in another section of the museum, right? Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, um, thank you to all of our guests for joining us today. Thanks for participating participating in the chat and hopefully you had fun learning more about fossils, what makes a fossil and even doing our fossil fossil knot. And of course, hopefully you will get a chance to come into the field sometime, see that wonderful opalized vertebrae, see Sue and Maximo, Tiktaalik and all of our favorite fossils. Thanks, Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, stay safe, stay curious. <laughs>